Coming up on Digital Music Trends 229, recorded on the 22nd of April 2015, Believe Digital acquires TuneCore, Tidal drifts to the bottom of the iOS apps chart, Guevara announces reaching 10 million users, dance music in the US is worth $1.9 billion, Spotify's advertising growth and the new head of publishing relations, the chart-topping Furious 7 soundtrack and much more. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. You can send your music to the Gramophone right from the Spotify app. And from that moment, the device will bypass your phone and stream directly from the Spotify servers, which means that your phone won't run out of charge and you'll be able to receive notifications and calls without interrupting your music experience. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Lionelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And uh, as I mentioned uh, last week, on the 6th of May, DMT is having a meetup to celebrate the 6th birthday of the show uh, with uh, some of our listeners, some of our, our previous guests uh, and, and friends of the show in general. So if you are in London or can get here, uh, you can sign up on digitalmusictrends.eventbrite.com. Again, it's on the 6th of May and I'd love to see you there. And uh, the event is actually tied to another occurrence which is my decision to stop the weekly show starting from mid-May so it was a bit of a tough decision but on the one hand it has proven difficult to combine the weekly schedule with the law studies and on the other hand I'm planning uh, to work on a new project uh, which I'll be talking about shortly so if you have been listening for a while and you haven't gotten in touch yet uh, do get in touch before the weekly shows uh, end. Uh, I will continue to do some podcasts every now and again but they won't be quite as regular as they've been in the past few years. And this week uh, on the show, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Larry Miller, a cl uh, clinical associates professor of music business uh, at the New York University and a uh, host of the recently launched uh, Musonomic podcast. So hi, Larry, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, Andrea. Very well. Uh, thanks for having me on the show this week. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Musonomic po Musonomics podcast has uh, recently launched with the first episode. And uh, it's a really great show uh, with a uh, guests and uh, all sorts of th things uh, talking about the music industry. There was a great p uh, feature on uh, Record Store Day, for example, uh, on, on the latest installment, so do go and check it out. Uh, do you have a separate website, Larry, for that? Uh, at musonomics.com Perfect. And uh, it's also a real pleasure to welcome back Taishi Fukuyama, founder of uh, Japan Market Entry Business Development Agency, PRTL, portal.jp. So hi, Taishi, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Very well, Andrea. Thanks for having me back. It's a great to have you, and uh, it's going to be a fun show, quite a packed show as well. Uh, and this week, uh, I'm going to try and start by not talking about one of the huge companies that we usually open with. Uh, uh, although we could, there are, there are news sort of in that, in that arena uh, uh, that are happening. But uh, I wanted to start by talking about uh, the uh, merger of uh, independent label services company and digital distributor Belief Digital with uh, TuneCore, uh, which obviously is probably known by everybody that listens to the show as one of the foremost uh, uh, services to distribute your music uh, to digital services as an independent uh, artist. So uh, TuneCore to date has distributed over half a billion dollars to independent artists and over the past couple of years also put a lot of effort in the development of its music publishing uh, ad administration arm so they develop some interesting IP there and uh, uh, the acquisition is likely to result in Believe and TuneCore being able to negotiate better deals with digital music stores and streaming services. Yeah, so an interesting merger here something that I hadn't really uh, it was uh, out of my radar or something that could have happened. Uh, uh, I interviewed the CEO of uh, or the head of uh, uh, Believe Digital uh, Denis Ladegarieri uh, in Cannes a, few, a couple of years ago and um, he had a really interesting vision for well, how Believe was going to uh, shape up as an international uh, sort of uh company and, and label services company uh, which ha has actually uh, uh, come to the fore to, 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 to some extent and uh, they didn't have any offices in the US uh, which uh, uh, this kind of uh, resolves because uh, TuneCore has got a couple of offices, one in New York and one in Nashville so uh, Larry, what do you make of this merger from, from a US perspective? Uh, is yeah, it something so this, that... So this wasn't on my radar at all right. it, was a, uh, it, it was a total surprise Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you consider the uh, the geographic fit, it makes uh, it makes utter sense. Uh, the uh, the U.S. acquisition uh, has uh, you know very you know good penetration here in the U.S. and the uh, in the DIY community uh, for the most part. And so, in terms of geographic fit, uh, it reminds me of. Uh, of now many years ago, the uh, uh, 
uh, the acquisition that actually formed the basis for uh, the Universal Music Group of today. Right. And that was the uh, the merger of MCA with, uh, at the time, Polygram. Uh, for many of the same reasons, uh, this merger makes industrial sense, although since both companies in the in this current merger are uh, private, uh, we don't know anything about the uh, the math uh, involved or the uh, or the revenues profitability the conditions of the balance sheet of either company but I've got to believe that uh, and no pun intended that uh, uh, if you subscribe to the notion that there is uh, uh, maybe a bit too much noise and a bit too much capacity in the independent distribution world, then this certainly uh, clarifies and quiets uh, some of that and provides a, uh, a coherent uh, global platform for uh, independent uh, DIY distribution for artists around the world. So from that perspective, it's a good thing. No, it makes makes total sense, and I think also the the fact that they operate on two slightly different uh, uh, you know levels in the sense that TuneCore was more catered to a hundred percent independent artists, whilst Believe is uh, working more with the sort of more developed artists or, or with labels outright, kind of complements the, the the two concepts. Uh, Taishi, what what's your take on that, and uh, and also on, on the international issues uh, of of the two companies uh, coming together? First of all, TuneCore actually has presence in Japan, so yeah. in terms of that uh, foot footprint um, expanding. I think uh, it's. I haven't seen a lot of uh, coverage right. on the fact that TuneCore has presence in Japan, but uh, so they've localized they the service mm -hmm. and, and, and it's actually available in Japanese. That's right, and uh, right. they also have uh, local staff there that provide the service and uh, have hooked up into the domestic services, and they are pretty active and trying to expand their business. Oh, wow. So, so uh, I think that's, and then also having Japanese content being able to leverage perhaps Believe services yeah. for Europe can be an exciting opportunity for Japanese content owners, uh, artists. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, it's a very it'd be interesting no, absolutely, that, you make a great point there. Like I, I hadn't actually realized that uh, TuneCore had an office in in in, in Japan because uh, uh, on their site I think they only list the the New York and the Nashville ones, and uh, obviously if I believe can get a presence in two of the biggest uh, territories for for music uh, in the world. That that's uh, that's quite a coup and uh, uh, definitely a well thought out uh, thing. Especially because in Japan, I guess that there are still a few hoops and barriers to to jump through if you want to. To enter the market, right? It's not. It's not uh, a straightforward market to get into. Uh, yeah, uh, that might probably be an understatement, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is. So, I'm not sure exactly what the communications would, uh, is presently with uh, the TuneCore Japan and overseas offices are. But um, yeah. hopefully, you know, I I know the TuneCore Japan guys. Uh, they're you know young, kind of nimble. Yeah. Maybe hopefully, with uh, greater assets now at hand, they can do. Uh, Bigger, better things. Yeah, and obviously I have to point out that uh, uh, I believe will keep uh, uh, TuneCore as a separate company, uh, at least for the f foreseeable future. Uh, it makes sense because TuneCore has got quite a lot of brand recognition uh, in, in itself, and, uh, and we'll see what happens there. I mean, it's it's uh, TuneCore is a company that has gone through uh, 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 quite a few motions. There were uh, you know several controversies around, uh, especially uh, its its founders. And, you know, obviously uh, you know so, so, uh, the founder being pushed out uh, of the company, and, and also of stuff happening around there so uh, it's kind of interesting to see that resolve into, into an acquisition ev eventually after a couple of years from all that uh, sort of noise happen and uh, uh, I remember recording a really uh, interesting interview with Jeff Price just uh, <laughs> a few months after that happened uh, at, uh, on, on, on the river at South Bay it was a, a good like 40 minute interview where we talked about it and uh, he was still pretty uh, angry about it at the time uh, but I'm, I'm sure now with Audium he's, uh, he, things have, have resolved and he's pretty happy with the new company and uh, uh, moving swiftly on from uh, TuneCore, there are, uh, once again we find ourselves uh, having to talk about uh, Tidal. 
So it's kind of like a, uh, I don't know how to avoid talking about it because every week it seems like they're coming out with a new feature or something new that uh, has to be announced, uh, uh, which uh, in a sense keeps them in the headlines. But on the other hand, I think it's only our headlines rather than uh, the mainstream public's headlines. Uh, so I'll try and run uh, through a couple of the major things uh, briefly. So first of all, the company ha appears to have uh, uh, lost uh, of, or fired the CEO, Andy Chen, uh, and uh, also uh, gotten rid of another 25 uh, staffers. Uh, we don't know how that, that process was carried out, uh, whether th those were uh, mainly uh, staffers in, in the HQ uh, or what positions they held. Uh, really, uh, we don't know much about that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it does feel like it is a little bit soon after the acquisition to go through such a uh, huge amount of cuts. Uh, and um, I'm also not sure whether the company could blame the CEO for the uh, botch, the launch of, of Tidal, or whether th there, was, there were other disagreements that, that caused this departure. Uh, Larry, from a business pers perspective point of view, do you think it's weird that uh, a company would cut down so much uh, uh, literally four weeks after an acquisition? Like, I mean, just for morale al alone, that, that could be disastrous, right? Honestly, uh, I don't have uh, much visibility into what's happening at the title organization. However, uh, I think we can make note of the, of the following things. One is that uh, Jay-Z bought a platform, right? Uh, so Jay-Z bought a platform, uh, uh, number one. Number two, uh, we can talk maybe a little bit about the launch and, uh, and really what was clearly one of the uh, most uncomfortable celebrity launches uh, of a digital music product or service in the 20 years that I've been watching this space. Uh, it was uh, it was almost like watching a uh, well I, I shouldn't say a, a car crash on TV or in the movies but it was uh, it was certainly not comfortable for any of the artists on that stage. Yeah. Uh, number three, you know, it's not uh, unheard of for there to be a an organizational restructuring uh, very soon after an acquisition, but. You know, remember that we're talking about a, a relatively tiny service here. Although, uh, although you and I, and uh, and and perhaps uh, uh, most of the people who uh, who view this podcast uh, have a uh, have a strong and even daily sense of what is happening in the space out in the world. Uh, Almost no one had heard of Title uh, before the launch. Yeah. Uh, you know, perhaps some of us had been subscribers at one time or another. I know that for me, uh, I had been a subscriber and shut it off uh, several times during the last year that the service was operating. I was completely intrigued by the idea of a high bitrate streaming service. Although, even for me, and I think that for others who are really active in the space, the question was, you know, if you're already a premium subscriber to Spotify or RDO or some other fully interactive digital music service, uh, what do you really need this uh, high bitrate service for? And yep. for anybody who has a pretty good playback rig, either in their desktop or throughout their house, it's a uh, you know it's a it's a question that I think many of us have been wondering about. And so I had tr turned the service on and off a couple of times during that trial. Although clearly, what Jay Z and uh, and his friends have bought uh, is a platform, and I think it remains it remains to be seen how uh, strongly they will push the high bit rate sort of super premium service versus the uh, the lower bit rate service that yeah. is maybe competing more directly with. Uh, Spotify, RDO, and the others. Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, w one of the things you touched upon is the fact that the public didn't know about the service before uh, this launch. Uh, and Taishi, one of the things that was pointed out by Boy Genius Report uh, just last night was the fact that the app uh, dropped very, very swiftly out of uh, the top apps in the I iOS store. I think at one point it reached the top 20 when uh, the uh, announcement was made immediately after, and now it's dropped uh, beyond the top 700, which is a 
crazy drop. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so uh, you know here we're looking at something that might have actually helped Spotify and Pandora rather than uh, hindered their performance because it made mm. people more aware of streaming services in general. Uh, people went to Tidal, realized it was a premium only offering, and they didn't want to pay, and then ended up going back to Spotify to get the freemium offering. So, uh, uh, w what do you think about that? And do you think that Tidal can somehow remedy the fact that it is a premium only product and it has no you know people have no way of uh, listening to any music unless they're paying for it uh, beyond the the trial period well i think uh, oh sorry go, ahead, go right ahead uh well uh, yeah larry uh, what you mentioned about um kind of how to differentiate i mean if, you, if you're just providing a high resolution service with a, even a smaller catalog it's really hard to compete yeah and that drop off in the uh, app store is um, it's, I think it wasn't a big surprise, I think, for many of us. And uh, what Jay-Z had, had spoken about at the launch, where he hopes to have Tidal become a playground for creatives for, that can make 15-minute songs or one minute, or you know, something that would be, that pushes the boundary of creativity. Yeah. I think that's the way he kind of said it in one form or another. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's not seeing that kind of content from any of the artists that were on that launch. Yeah, you're just seeing the 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 three minute, thirty second, pretty much top ten radio stuff from all of them. Yeah, and they wish to have title be this place for artists. It's kind of felt like a big disconnect for me, first of all. And um, but you know, having seen like Spotify and other other services. Uh, become a big destination for venture capital for you know capital gain capital returns yeah and that controversy towards artists and compensation I think has spawned this title whole, this whole movement where artists want to feel more fairly treated compensated and now the biggest artists in the world have the ability to just pretty much purchase this smaller project yeah. and hope for a return. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, yes. However, having said that, in uh, in almost every case, the artists involved uh, uh, with title, with the with maybe the notable exceptions of Jay Z and Madonna, uh, are signed to uh, long term recording agreements uh, that were signed uh, from a few years ago to quite a very long time ago, uh, and that the royalties that are paid in to those recording agreements under whatever royalty rubric is worked out between the uh, the services themselves and the and the record companies are governed by those recor recording agreements with the artists and so i think that it may be uh, uh, wishful thinking uh, the desire to equalize the uh, the playing field or any number of reasons that has caused this group of artists to get together at this time around title and on this particular issue. But the simple fact of the matter is that in today's music industry, uh, at least, uh, artists are not signing directly with a single digital distribution platform. They are signing with a record company that is uh, that is there to act as a bank and a uh, marketing conduit across all platforms and across every territory in the world. Yeah, uh, and I think that we need to bear that in mind when we when we start, uh, you know, talking about uh, the paltry royalty rates that uh, that artists say that they're being paid, and and you know their claims are absolutely true. Uh, from uh, you know Spotify and the uh, the more radio-like services in uh, in the U.S. and really every territory around the world. So I think that we understand the the sentiment. However, there is this other factor. Uh, the other factor is the recording agreements to which every every one of those artists is signed for uh, global exploitation of their music and promotion and marketing in uh, in every territory around the world. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It is a, a, a difficult situation. I think. Also, I wonder how uh, 
kind of concern the labels might be of backlash from other services like uh, Apple's upcoming streaming service uh, 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 when it comes to promoting releases by the artists that are actually part of the title deal uh, mm -hmm. given that you know it could be seen as an it is obviously an endorsement uh, an endorsement of title over any other service and and how that might play in in the long term uh, uh, it's it's difficult uh, Taishi, I, I was wondering uh, on the stream and more uh, generally on the streaming side I don't believe title is launched in Japan uh, are you hoping that for perhaps Apple will launch in Japan when they do open up uh, uh, given that they do they, they, do they have a presence in Japan yet with the iTunes store or, or not mm, title uh, uh, Apple sorry with the iTunes store uh, uh, I'm sorry so the does Apple is Apple open in Japan right now for with the iTunes store or not yes yes yes, yes okay cool so th there is a chance that they might want to launch something when, when the when the service comes out yeah uh, many services have been trying to launch in Japan for quite some time. Uh, yeah, uh, so we've been talking about it for three years, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, and uh, I think the the X day or the X year for Japan, uh, it feels like at least being here in Japan is this year. Um, right. But but uh, obviously, many have said that the previous years too. So who knows? But. <laughs> uh, definitely looking at the numbers, it's really hard for the industry to hold out and just lay back on uh, physical sales. So, uh, some, and also, also the dynamics of how freemium is being looked at overseas is, I think, going to be a contributing factor for some of the labels here in Japan to consider uh, freemium models coming into Japan. Yeah. So, uh, that's definitely going to influence, I think, some of the negotiations. Um, I'm sure some labels in Japan will say, we told you so, freemium doesn't work. But um, obviously, that's a very uh, dynamic, fast-paced conversation uh, globally. So I think it's really hard. Uh, it'll just be one more ingredient for the labels here to consider. But overall, I think, uh, and many people within the industry in Japan, at least, feel that uh, th there needs to be a service, whether it be international or domestic, that yep. does start streaming and that uh, gets the consumers ready for that, that type of music consumption. And, and I seem to remember also that the, the, the problem here was the fact that uh, uh, there's such a high uh, degree of competition between the, the labels inside Japan that it would have been very difficult for a domestic service to emerge, to, uh, to, to have emerged like Vivo, for example, or something that might bring them together uh, into uh, in providing sort of a domestic catalog to, to domestic users. But that, that's probably not, not going to happen, right? Well, actually, the Japanese content industry ha has uh, kept come together to form Rekochoku, which is a um, music, digital music store, right. and it was very heavily tied to the feature phones, which were the non, the, the dumb phones of the day. Yeah. And when the consumers outgrew that technology, shifting to smartphones, like the, the service didn't migrate with it. So there's there's been a whole demographic of consumers that have been hauled out that have no really place to go to stream music or uh, that have the right catalog for yeah. Japanese content and international co content. That's, uh, that's so crazy. it's a big problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's mad and definitely something that we don't have in the in the UK or in the US, where uh, there's probably too much choice at this point, and, and consumers uh, mm. are, are faced mm. with so many different services uh, that uh, have come into the market. Uh, also, if, for example, the, just this morning, uh, I was reading about Guvera uh, announcing that they reached the 10 million users, another service that is sort of flies under the radar for the for the most part, uh, uh, but uh, quietly they have built up a, a pretty big user base. They are uh, available also in the US uh, and uh, in Australia. Australia and, and um, 18 other countries uh, amassed 3 million users in India uh, and uh, are based on a freemium model. So, you know, it's, it's mm. kind of tough. Although, Larry, do you think that services like Guvera or services that don't have the kind of clout or, or marketing or, or Spotify, for example, can they uh, continue to survive as a niche service in, in a territory like the US or do you need that scale to actually to actually uh, carry on? Right, right. So, so in the US, uh, um, None of the studies that are examining uh, uh, brand recognition in the digital music space uh, even even recognize Guvera. No, you know, honestly, it's uh, I think it's terrific that they have launched in the United States. No consumers have heard of them, at least none at a large enough scale that can even move the needle. Uh, so we should make note of that. Also, I think that 
it's fantastic that uh, that Guevara have been able to achieve the penetration that they have in markets like India. And although I don't know this for a fact, I have to guess that that is uh, uh, must have been achieved through partnerships with uh, telcos and and mobile service operators. Yeah, uh, I, I presume that that's the case, but uh, you know, but I don't know it for sure. Uh, fact is, it is very expensive to run these services, and I think that the answer to your question, Andrea, really lies in whether there is a class of investors uh, that is continuing to um, retain interest in funding a business that is growing at the rate that Guvera is, and apparently there is a decent positive growth rate there. Uh, whether they will continue to uh, uh, capture capital and be able to uh, raise money at a rate that will that will enable them to sustain the business and enter new markets and penetrate better the ones that they are already in, I suppose we will uh, we will find out shortly. Yeah. Yeah, and also well, we're going to have to see it. There's a, a couple of things that I'm sort of questioning about the press release. Uh, for example, they claim that they got two and a half million users from the service Blink Box Music uh, that they purchased from Tesco in the UK. But uh, uh, at the time that the service was purchased, uh, it had a long history behind it of, of, of different iterations of the service. So I can imagine that quite a lot of people would have registered for the service. But I, I would just question how many people were actually using the service by the time it was it was acquired. And so uh, I, I would also love to know uh, what the figures for active users are as opposed to just registered users, because uh, I think there's some some I, I don't know. It just seems it seemed odd that that many people were signed up to Blink Box Music when I don't think anybody had really uh, heard much about it here in the UK. It just seemed like a really high, uh, really high figure. And um, talking about streaming services, uh, uh, actually Medium, uh, which is happening uh, on the first week of June uh, in Cannes, has announced that uh, Deezer's new CEO is going to deliver the uh, keynote in, in the form of a Q&A uh, at the conference. So we're going to hear a little bit more about Deezer's plans there. And obviously the company has launched in the US as well with its uh, Deezer Elite service, which is another $20 a month uh, high quality streaming service, which is exclusively tied to Sonos, at least for the time being. So you have to have a Sonos system to try it out. Uh, but uh, interesting to see uh, Deezer, you know, continue to make moves. Obviously, the partnership with Media makes sense because uh, uh, they're both uh, French uh, entities. And so it makes sense for them to give the keynote and announce new stuff uh, there. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what their plans are uh, when it comes to taking on the US uh, uh, since, uh, you know, they can only do so much as a premium service, like premium premium service, uh, they need to somehow find a, a, another way to uh, to enter that market. And, uh, you know, there's a few news around Spotify as well this week, uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, First of all, let's let's talk about dance music. So one of the things that came up this week was that at the International Music Summit Engage event, uh, Kevin Watson from Dance Economics provided some key figures around electronic music in North America, which now is worth 1.9 billion annually. It's it's a massive figure. Uh, it's, it continues to grow. You know, we're seeing uh, companies, uh, uh, you know, uh, invest a lot of money in, in this space. You know, uh, SFX is entirely dedicated to uh, 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 to dance music, and you know, it's it's a public company and and uh, has made a lot of investments. In the space uh, we're seeing a, a continued growth uh, especially in the live sector obviously the recorded music side is kind of uh, a, a, a small proportion of that is only 225 million over 1.9 billion while the rest of it is uh, 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 goes to uh, festivals and the clubs and the clubs also turn turn over some incredible amounts of money especially in Las Vegas uh, some of the some of the key clubs uh, uh, over uh, there have uh, uh, amassed incredible revenues uh, of hundreds of millions of dollars a year uh, so Taishi uh, from uh, from your perspective, for lo looking uh, in from from Japan, it has this electronic craze also come uh, to Japan. And uh, as far as the US is concerned, do you think that this continued growth, uh, uh, you know, which seemed like a fad maybe uh, two years ago, but it seems like to be a continu continued trend now. So, do you think it can be sustained? Uh, I think, in terms of the longevity longevity of the EDM craze, that 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 boom, it's still going to continue at least in. In Japan, uh, the concert promoters here are talking with the bigger festival titles uh, internationally to bring them to Japan. For example, we had the Ultra uh, Music Festival, and uh, Electric Zoo will be coming right. to Japan. Yeah, so um, some of some of that culture is coming to Japan. And I think the good thing about EDM, at least in Japan, is that um, there it's really not about just the chart movement and being keen on that that part of the music culture, but 
uh, the fashion side of it, and yeah. and I think that's that really appeals to Japan, and just being a part of that culture, I think, uh, resonates well with, with Japanese listeners. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Also, you know, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, territories, some, sometimes you see a bit of a delayed reaction. You know, something that that goes really well uh, over in the U.S. Or, or in Europe, it takes a while for it to sort of travel around and makes it make make its way and be properly sort of, uh, uh, f- for lack of a better word, uh, exploited to a certain extent mm-hmm. in different territories. Uh, Larry, uh, from a U.S. perspective, do, do you think that uh, we're starting to peak? Uh, can this grow uh, more? Uh, and you know, are the investments that are being made right now proportional to the value of the market? Uh, well, so uh, you know, you mentioned SFX. Uh, um, if you take a look at the uh, stock price of SFX, it has been struggling, and I think that the yeah. capital markets uh, uh, are expressing doubt as to whether uh, uh, this time around the. Uh, the business can grow at the rate in the future that it has in the past. Um, you know, I'm looking uh, as we're talking at the uh, at the Dantonomic study that uh, that was underneath the IMS business report that we're talking about, and that uh, I'm looking at the uh, at the data on uh, electronic music clubs in the USA by revenue, and you know, yeah. it's it it really is interesting that the top five clubs. Uh, are all in, well, actually four out of the top five are in Las Vegas. One of them is in Miami. Only the number sixth club is, uh, is, uh, is in New York. And of course, the club business is driven by, by, by many things. Uh, recorded music sales is not one of those things. <laughs> uh, although the, uh, the major music companies, as a result of uh, smart A&R and just good distribution deals, have, uh, have come a little bit late to the uh, to the EDM business, which is a, a genre that really broke uh, without major labels and without any radio airplay whatsoever. Having said that, as a genre, uh, this type of music has found its way onto the pop radio charts in the U.S. and elsewhere. And I, re- I think I read uh, elsewhere in the study that uh, uh, actually I want to... Um, I want to make sure that I don't misquote the uh, the statement from the study, sure, of course. and that is that uh, in both the U.S. and Canada, uh, dance music, electronic dance music, is the fourth most popular genre for streams, uh, which is to say higher than country. And so uh, the first three, of course, being uh, R&B, hip-hop, rock, and pop, followed by uh, electronic dance music. Uh, after electronic dance music is, you know, country by streams. Now, country is by far uh, outselling electronic dance music, yeah. uh, and in fact, is driving much of the uh, of the chart movement that exists in the U.S. and and the other major music territories around the world. But I think it's noteworthy that in the uh, in the streaming marketplace that uh, EDM has uh, has found its way into the uh, into the top five uh, uh, right below pop music that is noteworthy yeah yeah no absolutely and, and it also for, to me it's, it's amazing to see, look at some of the uh, clubs I, I had a look around the Hakasan Hakasan I, I don't know how to pronounce it I'm so out of the scene in Vegas and uh, uh, you know you see artists like you know David Guetta and, and, and Diplo they have uh, weekly residences and you just kind of think Gosh, the air miles that they must uh, pile up because obviously they're, they're they're touring all over the world whilst they're doing this this weekly residence and they're just coming back every week to Vegas right. to do that one slot. Right. Well, 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 never never mind the air miles. <laughs> How about the talent fees? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. incidentally, those club owners are are generating lots and lots and lots of alcohol sales at ninety percent plus gross margins per drink. So as a business model, this is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's sort of why you see uh, uh, someone like Calvin Harris make six to six million a year. It's not uh, driven by uh, music sales, that's for sure. That's driven by lots of other stuff, mostly live. And uh, 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 Larry, you mentioned uh, uh, you know the amount of streams of dance music, and one of the interesting stories of this week was uh, the fact that uh, we've seen yet another uh, soundtrack album, uh, uh, you know, take the charts by storm uh, to to a certain extent, which is the Furious Seven soundtrack for the latest installment of the Fast and Furious. 
series mu movie franchise uh, and uh, it's proven to be super popular not just in the US but also in the UK and in, in, in other parts of the world so in the US the album has managed the rare feat of moving from number two to number one of the Billboard 200 albums chart um, and uh, the lead single obviously is topping the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, in the UK, the, the single is uh, the number one of the, the singles charts as well. See You Again uh, by uh, Wiz Khalifa. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, 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 it's broken the record of, 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 of streams from Spotify. Uh, the most streams in one day, which was 4.2 million streams. Uh, and, and a record that was previously held actually by Ellie Golding for the uh, soundtrack uh, track of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, Love Me Like You Do. So. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, why are we seeing the, this sort of prominence of mu movie related songs uh, come up again it's something that I don't know perhaps I hadn't noticed myself uh, that much uh, in recent years but in the last couple of years we've seen a lot more tracks come through uh, that way is, is that a particular reason do you think why that is you know these soundtracks are really juggernauts in the culture aren't they uh, they have just uh, it's not that they've come from nowhere uh, but uh, they are resonating in popular culture in a way that uh, music soundtracks really haven't for uh, quite a long period of time, as you've pointed out. And I think that we can attribute that to uh, uh, a couple of underlying reasons. One is uh, the, the nature of the, uh, the hit-driven uh, movie business and that uh, uh, certain films uh, at certain times, whether we're talking about Furious 7 this year or Guardians of the Galaxy uh, last year, are, uh, are embraced by just a gigantic number of people and in fact are driven by soundtracks that, uh, uh, that have absolutely great A&R. Uh, the songs sound great. Uh, if the songs are old, they have been remixed uh, and remastered within an inch of their lives, and they are presented in an extremely compelling way uh, on their physical and digital soundtrack records. And as you pointed out, they are uh, in some cases streamed uh, more than uh, more than anything else in the history of the music streaming services. And so. Uh, it's a it's a function of uh, the popularity of uh, of juggernauts in movie culture that contain within them just you know brilliant A and R uh, and the music supervisors and the and the directors responsible for the films are just doing um, they're doing uh, fantastic jobs and I think that it's a it's a testament to the to the lasting value of music. Uh, within movies, especially yeah. uh, hit movies that are targeted toward the uh, the heart of uh, popular culture. Yeah, Taishi, do, do these uh, soundtracks have the same impact in Japan? And from a local perspective, uh, do you see something similar happening when it comes to the the homegrown movie uh, industry and, and and the use of music within that? Uh, not only in movies, but in in the Japanese context, uh, I think animation is the no brainer for for locals here. That tie music soundtracks, music with uh, with movie animated content. So I think Japanese are definitely used to um, tying or experiencing music content with with film or, or movies. And also, um, the success of Frozen, yeah, uh, in Japan <laughs> was just crazy. But another aspect of that that gave it that extra amount of success I think was the way that uh, the lyrics were localized and they had a, a domestic artist sing that same song and it was just drilled into everybody's ears for at least a whole year <laughs> and that, that, that type of uh, localization I think just was uh, brilliant in the part of uh, that organization for Disney. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, Disney has always been very very good at at that. Uh, you know, I uh, they localized uh, everything uh, for everywhere really so from the very beginning. I I, rem I know all of the songs from the old movies in Italian, uh, and uh, and so if if I watch an old movie now, I'm, I'm still gonna sing the song in Italian. And and, and they were brilliantly recorded and brilliant, brilliantly rendered, and the lyrics were really you know well translated. And if they couldn't translate them properly, they just made them up. Uh, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's a long proud history from Disney to do that uh, and uh, uh, no it's, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting aspect of, of that I, I want to see Princess Kaguya actually for talking about Japanese movies uh, the, the other day it was such a good film really really good uh, and it was the first movie I've ever seen that has a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes that that is quite spectacular wow. I hadn't seen that before <laughs> so uh, so yeah definitely worth uh, worth uh, watching and quite different from the usual sort of Studio Ghibli movies a different type of drawing and uh, more sort of pencil driven uh, and less sort of filled in uh, smooth uh, which is uh, which made it quite cool and uh, let's talk about Spotify a little bit so a few news are coming up from Spotify and the first w- there's a few to pick from so the first thing is that uh, whilst we've been talking about ad funded businesses and the fact that uh, Universal has been sort of uh, 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 talking about the fact that they're not too happy with the revenues coming up from uh, the ad supported side of, of, of streaming services uh, Spotify released uh, a figure around that uh, saying that uh, they are ad- their advertising uh, uh, revenues grew 53% between Q1 of 2014 and Q1 of 2015, uh, especially uh, with a 380% growth in mobile advertising. Although, sort of proportionally, if you look at that growth with uh, the the overall growth, uh, that must mean that it's still a, a fairly small proportion of the overall advertising revenues that they have. That probably most of them come from the uh, desktop version of the of the uh, app still. Uh, so uh, interesting here to see that growth. You know, obviously they didn't give us any real numbers that we can go on. Uh, also interesting to see that the, the 50% growth is kind of similar to the growth uh, in users they've had over the last year. So that doesn't necessarily signal a huge improvement in the way that they monetize. It's just a, a natural progression of the growth in audience that also drove uh, growth in in. Um, and the ad support monetization. So uh, I don't. I don't know. To, honestly, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, I wonder if that's going to help in, in terms of its negotiations with uh, Universal for the renewal of the licenses. Uh, uh, what do you guys think? Well, for me, uh, I think that until Spotify uh, is able to demonstrate that they can punch uh, way above their weight in uh, in advertising sales, and I think you you hit the nail on the head, Andrea, when you when you talked about uh, revenue growth in advertising needing to exceed uh, uh, user growth or user acquisition is really going to be a very key metric to watch. Um, Something else to think about, though, in Spotify is that uh, although I don't remember the exact uh, revenue splits, uh, Spotify's revenues are are uh, in the range of eighty percent subscriber driven, yeah, uh, and the rest in advertising. And until they are able to uh, uh, never mind flip that, but just shift. Uh, some of that revenue in favor of uh, of advertising, uh, which uh, which of course is taking place on the uh, on the free tier, then I think that they're going to continue to have a, uh, a a I don't know about a difficult time, but maybe a uh, a longer period of negotiation with the major music companies. Who together, let's remember, own about twenty percent of Spotify equity, and so it is a uh, it is a complicated uh, negotiation indeed. Uh, we should also bear in mind that for the radio services like Pandora here in the U.S. and in North America, that that those revenue splits are reversed, yeah. and that for more radio-like services, they are overwhelmingly supported by advertising and the. Uh, Relatively few of their um, of their installed base are paying for the premium service uh, where they can hear music streams, you know, yeah. commercial free. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Taishi, obviously, I, I I forgot to point out that you actually did some work with Spotify. So I don't know if you still work with them or if you can talk about this or not. So uh, uh, just whatever you can, essentially. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I, um, having been a uh, represent. Uh, uh, having been representing Equonest for a Japanese market, I did have some interaction with, with Spotify naturally. Um, right now, I do not, just, okay, to, cool, yeah. just for the record. Great. But um, uh, I think right now, going into renegotiations, anything that justifies holding on to that free tier, uh, they're going to Spotify will throw out any sort of supporting numbers for that. Um, but again, it's without the the hard data behind that, and maybe even some uh, third-party, like um, 
looking into some of the real data there, it's really hard to say, I think. And that's yeah. why I agree with both of your yeah, absolutely. Uh, comments. No, and also the, the cool thing is that, I mean, one of the things that is promising is the fact that the company has announced that they will now uh, integrate sort of playlisting data and all sorts of stuff uh, within their advertising engine, which uh, I actually would have assumed that it would have had already been integrated, but apparently not. And so now, uh, for example, an advertiser is going to be able to uh, tie an advert to somebody that is uh, 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 using a sleeping uh, playlist uh, if they're advertising some sort of mechanism to go to I don't know something to go to sleep with or uh, you know some sort of uh, uh, you know workout uh, uh, clothes or, or, or energy drinks uh, if somebody is, is, is uh, at the gym or going for a run so so that sort of could lead to uh, some interesting uh, higher uh, sort of rates of, of, uh, of uh, click-throughs and all sorts of stuff for for Spotify for if they can uh, target the adverts a little bit, bit more uh, accurately through playlisting uh, you know obviously that's all in the future they've only just implemented this new feature so we're going to have to see how that uh, sort of uh, uh, new development shapes up for, for them but uh, but no I mean it's definitely a, a good thing and the other thing that happened on Spotify this week is that they actually appointed a global head of uh, publisher relations and so this is kind of an important step for the company because uh, we've heard a lot of uh, 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 noise from the publishing community uh, uh, you know publishers to a certain extent have been uh, have uh, at the beginning of streaming uh, to a certain extent they turned a blind eye to it to I mean maybe that's unfair but at the same time it, it did feel like they uh, uh, they also assumed that the royalties were going to be calculated similarly to, to, to sales and now they are realizing that that probably wasn't supposed to be the case and, and, and given that they're having such a small percentage of uh, the overall revenues uh, they're now trying to, to increase that uh, and, and, and so you know they're making a lot of noise around how much money is going into uh, back to publishers from from um, streaming services. Uh, Spotify has done pretty well so far, you know, uh, even Sony ATV who was a strong critic of, of streaming uh, signed again uh, with, with them uh, this year and Martin, Band B M Martin Bandier said he was delighted with the terms uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issues continue and so obviously the fact that they have this new global head of music publishing relations uh, called uh, James Duffett Smith uh, is a positive development for, for uh, the company going forward. Uh, Larry, do you think that this, we're going to continue to hear this debate on, on publishing but it is there anything that can be done around that? Well, look, I think it is an excellent move for Spotify to uh, uh, to put uh, uh, someone strong and credible in that role, and uh, and what it, it is signaling is that they are hearing the uh, uh, the uh, uh, pushback. They're feeling the pushback from the publishing community in a fairly pointed way, and they are going to seek to improve that in any ways that they can. Um, the, uh, the, the, the the differences between licensing rubrics or among licensing rubrics, whether we are talking about uh, radio-like streaming services like uh, Pandora and others uh, here in, in other territories uh, or uh, download services like iTunes, uh, where there is uh, primarily a pass-through license involved where the labels are paid and then the, uh, the publishers are paid a paltry uh, percentage of what the record labels are paid, uh, which, uh, which was okay in the beginning and is less okay now. Yeah. Uh, and then looking at the, you know, this third rubric for fully interactive streaming, uh, just over the last several years is one where the, where the publishers really do feel empowered and uh, and they are, uh, and I think rightfully so, uh, seeking to uh, not just correct uh, an injustice that has been done uh, to them and to the songwriters, but you know honestly, if one considers the uh, the contribution of the creators of the music, the songwriters themselves in. Uh, in the overall value of the of the music that we uh, that we love, that we buy, that we stream, that we pay attention to, and that we discover and uh, and um, and tell all of our friends about, uh, you know, the, I think that the the simple fact of the matter is that uh, uh, publishers and writers uh, do need to. Uh, 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 collect more value. Uh, 
than they have been able to do uh, so far in either the uh, pay-to-download services or in the more radio-like uh, offerings that, that predated Spotify by, by a good six or seven years or more. And so uh, I think that the, the appointment of, uh, of a strong executive to lead that effort and to, and to run those communications and negotiations with the publishers is a, uh, is a, uh, is a good idea and was probably overdue. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, Taishi, from whenever we talked, uh, I had you on the show a few times before, but I don't think we ever talked about pu music publishing in Japan and, and what's going on there. So, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the roadblocks are often put, uh, put in by the record labels because they also act as management companies uh, for a lot of the artists and, and they, they hold a lot of the strings uh, on, that, on that front. Is publishing also one of those strings? Uh, is publishing tied with a record deal or are there separate companies that manage that, that, that side of it? Um. Yeah, it's very fragmented, like many things in Japan here. So it, I think it's a, a little bit of a unique situation. Um, I think hearing Larry's opinion about how, um, I, I too agree that Spotify should be applauded about being more active. And, and I think uh, Spotify's stance in general of being transparent. And I was just thinking about our conversation about, about Tidal previously and, and how I, we haven't really seen much of that yet from Tidal and to see what how the revenue splits are going to be and and artists complaining about compensation and at the end of the day um, I, I wonder like what it is that some of the non global hit artists really um, hope to achieve in terms of like their their publishing compensation and songwriters and is it do you think that uh, I'm, I'm kind of just speaking as I'm thinking but um, is it possible that like a lot of these s songwriters or smaller independent artists should have complete transparency t to see how little they're getting despite the fact that so a lot of these um, streaming services are trying to get more uh, of very little that that is there is my question I guess yeah it's it's a tough one I think uh, you know from my point of view uh, there is you know there are a lot of issues around publishing because as i said you know the the percentage that goes to publishers is small increasing that percentage means that either a percentage is taken away from the recorded side or that the service uh, eats further into its own uh, profits which are not profits at the moment because most of the services that are operating in this space are not profitable and so obviously that's the same issue with pandora uh, pandora's uh, publishers get a tiny tiny proportion and and the, the master uh, owners and the artists get over 50 percent of 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 the of of the uh, revenues that come in and so the question is if we increase that figure uh, by law through the the, the you know compulsory uh, uh, orders and, and sort of a royalty uh, copper copper royalty board uh, a rate setting then where does the money come from does it come from the 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 master's uh, side or does it come uh, from the the uh, pot that remains to the service uh, and again uh, pandora is also not yet profitable so that's 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 a bit of a question mark uh, uh, larry do you think that this is going to be resolved in the next uh, in the next year or so or are we going well, to continue to see well i don't think it's going to be resolved in the <laughs> short term there will be yeah. new crb rates uh, however uh, you know just being as uh, i guess as uh, as straight as i can about what i think is going to happen uh, the, you know, the money's going to have to come out of the recorded music side. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the thing that uh, relatively few people have been willing to say in exactly those words. But, uh, you know, 50% in Spotify's, or rather in Pandora's case, and 70% of income being distributed to rights holders in Spotify's case is, uh, is, uh, is high, but, but not uh, unsustainable. And so, when we look at sort of the reallocation or the parsing of the cost of goods sold for music in the space, uh, what we what we're really talking about here is rebalancing, yeah. and so uh, that is what is going to have to be uh, unpacked and renegotiated. I think over the next several years, in some cases, it will be with uh, government uh, assistance or insistence. Uh, and in others, it'll have to be decided in the marketplace. Yeah. But uh, you know, the simple fact of the matter is that songwriters, music creators, have not been fairly compensated for their contribution in in creating the works that we love and care about and pay for in either time or or, or money. 
uh, in the digital era, and that I think uh, will be um, corrected over yeah. the, this next uh, uh, several years. Hopefully, and fingers can crossed. I, can I say something? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, an interesting thing that's happening in Japan is that we have a, uh, a video streaming platform called Nico Nico. If you would imagine the kind of like a YouTube with uh, interactive like comments that you can write on top of the actual video player, it's very popular among uh, independent creators that uh, write songs with Vocaloid software. Um, you may have heard of Hatsune Miku, which is one of the most popular ones that even uh, Lady Gaga has used to be her opening act for her shows. And but uh, the, the a lot of the con the creators there don't uh, do get compensated from ad revenue and premium subscription. But there has been an uh, industry organization formed that doesn't uh, necessarily give back, not in just the ad and premium revenue, and certainly not the uh, the shares like title, but in a way that it gives back uh, feedback on how to do taxes or you know something that that really f supports the the creator's uh, lifestyle. I was wondering if there's like organizations like that in Europe or, or in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, there, so here in the U.S., there are uh, you know various services that are looking to uh, support artist businesses, uh, and these are sort of you know business management and advisory uh, services in the cloud for. Uh, uh, mostly for touring artists, but I don't think we've seen that yet as part of a uh, music streaming or download service. Right. Interesting. So it's it's kind of like a special purpose vehicle almost that has shares that doesn't give back in uh, capital return, but in those kind of uh, s different sorts of services. It's almost like what a membership to a to an organization, like it could be AIM here in the UK or a oh, yeah. in the US, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I mean, as long as like the, the transparency is there and you can say, well, I can maybe even forfeit my ad revenue or premium subscription revenue until I reach this much and then I won't receive the benefits of those services and, and yeah. go straight out ad revenue and, you know, and I think maybe there's th that kind of tiered compensation for creators, maybe that's an option somewhere in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And well, I think that's uh, all for this week and we need to probably wrap it up. But uh, uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Uh, and for Taishi, uh, go and check out uh, PR tl.jp uh, portal.jp uh, for all that's going on there and if you are a startup or, or company that's looking uh, to uh, move into Japan uh, definitely give them a shout uh, they do some uh, great stuff and uh, Larry uh, once again it's a Musonomics uh, podcast the new thing that you can look at uh, so it's twitter.com slash Musonomics uh, for all the information on that and that's bi-monthly right so you should have the next one in the next uh, couple of weeks that is correct Perfect. And uh, uh, you can also check out Larry's profile uh, on the NYU website. I'll, I'll throw a link in for that. And uh, thanks so much for your time this week. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And thanks so much for listening. Uh, you can find out everything on Digital Music Trends on digitalmusictrends.com or follow us on Twitter on at Digital Music Trends. Uh, have a fantastic week. And until next time.